Thank you for joining us, everyone. We're excited to continue our Executive Leadership Webinar Series with you today with Executive Leadership Coach Tim Rethmeyer. I'm Mary Vandenplas, Director of Research and Operations here at Birchworks. I would like to introduce Tim Rethmeyer, founding partner at Rethmeyer Partners. Tim has put his considerable experience as a quantitative executive to use in his coaching services company. He has previously held leadership positions at Starcom Worldwide, IRI, SPSS IBM, and Mintel. Now Tim shares his insights with executives and companies around the globe and has partnered with Birchworks to extend his considerable expertise to our network. Over to you, Tim. Hey, thanks, Mary. Um, I appreciate being here and welcome to everybody who's on the call or listening to the recordings uh, down the line. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, the topic that we're talking about on our onboarding is just of critical importance to the success of companies. It costs a lot of money and emotional capital when transitioning in new employees, especially at the senior levels. And it's very personal to me. I've seen success and I've seen failure on both sides of the table. It really hit home when I was talking to a C-suite leader in an analytics company who had just wrapped up a year-long search for another senior leader. He was relieved and felt they had landed a good hire. When he said, we'll see how she works out, my head about exploded. We'll see? That's so passive. My next question was, what's your onboarding plan? HR is handling it, he said. Don't get me wrong, I love HR, but my head exploded again. Onboarding is not something to hope works out, nor is it to be outsourced. Everyone needs to be involved in developing and executing the process to maximize the likelihood of success. And it's a time to look at your own leadership skills to see what you're doing well or what you're avoiding or just not very good at. Successful onboarding is a cultural and financial opportunity for a company to hit a home run or to create a costly blunder. Overall, according to Sherm, the national employee turnover rate is about 18%. And a great deal of this voluntary turnover happens within the first six months. Helping employees get through those early months successfully leads to greater longevity with the company, and there is, of course, the obvious cost savings. There's a high personal and professional risk for both the company and the employee at this moment in time. It's not just a structural change. It's also personal and emotional. For the employee, this is a time of anticipation and anxiety. There's rarely complete clarity, and there's inevitable confusion as they step into a new role. There are high hopes, and there's a fear of failure. This was a big move. I'm not really sure what I've gotten myself into. Who here is familiar with the imposter syndrome? Who is a professional job hunter who is really good at interviewing, and when they land the job, they're not sure they can cut it? Or who has stepped into a role and was not what you expected? A client of mine had landed a senior level position where he would be groomed to take over the CEO role in two years. It had taken him a year or so to find this perfect position. Within the first few weeks, he felt he had been lied to and misled about the state of the company and his role. The sales were, not, were down, not because of new business, but due to the attrition of current clients. The existing sales team was more junior than he had been led to believe. And he had to fire an employee who was a relative of a board member. He was ticked off and ready to walk. We did a lot of coaching to help him reframe the situation and have different conversations across the company, and have difficult conversations across the company. He stuck around and has, in fact, become the CEO. The leadership team at that company was precipitously close to losing their ideal hire. For company leadership, there's a sigh of relief when the talent search is finally over. There's an excitement for what this new leader can offer and all the problems they can solve. They're expected to be the hero who can get us to the next level or to prove how right it was that that last guy is out of here. And at the same time, there's fear of, what if we made the wrong choice? Often there's not unanimous consent about the new leader or there are a few red flags we have to watch out for. For both the leadership team and the new leader, onboarding is too often a missed opportunity. Too much is left to chance, 
The fragmented process is spread across too many parts, parts of the organization, and there's not enough focus on the individual in question. Too much emphasis is on company structure and systems and not enough on the strength and success of the individual and the role. Regarding onboarding as a two-way street helps increase the, like, increase the likelihood of employee satisfaction, retention, and productivity, resulting in more success for both the individual and the organization. It can't just be a checklist. It has to be thoughtfully considered from individual, structural, and cultural perspectives. So today we're going to be talking about how to successfully onboard new employees and leadership into your organization. When I talk about leaders, and we're talking a lot about senior leaders, all employees, but you're all leaders. Everyone's a leader. You're a leader of yourself first and foremost. How do you bring people into this, into your organization? So the topics, onboarding beyond training and paperwork, six critical steps for onboarding new talent, improving leadership skills for onboarding success, and we're definitely going to set some time aside at the end for any questions uh, that you guys might have. Organizations will use checklists to make sure everything from signing the HR paperwork to ID badges to scheduling training sessions are all in place. Great. So necessary. But if that's where it stops, there's bound to be trouble. Some critical parts of the employee experience can be overlooked or glossed over if the company is solely focused on just checking the boxes. I recently saw a seven-page checklist for onboarding that was extremely thorough. The section called Introduce Company Culture caught my eye. There were seven boxes to check under this heading, including coordinate welcome lunch, explain dress code. Another item in this group was compile company information, including values, mission, neighborhood or area map, contact information, etc. My head about exploded again. If the values and mission of a company are clear and honored by the organization, only compiling them for a new employee and hand it off in a file that includes a map of lunch spots in the area is going to result in a missed opportunity to create that productive employee who wants to stick around. Employees are not just robots waiting to get programmed. Successful onboarding takes into account the human side of the equation as well. Let's take a look at some of the additional steps that leadership can take to set new employees and other leaders up for success. Onboarding should not solely be left up to HR. There are six steps senior leaders can take in shaping the onboarding of new employees, and most of it is leveraging and improving your leadership skills. I really want to make it clear I'm thinking of anyone who is hiring and onboarding, and especially C-suite leaders. You have a responsibility to step into the role of chief onboarder. It can be uncomfortable. You'll use skills you might not have, feel it is beneath you, or feel you don't have the time, and that's a huge mistake. Own the success of onboarding yourself. All right. Number one, clearly and confidently articulate the vision and mission of your organization. I worked for a company once who one weekend posted their mission statement and five guiding principles in every conference room and next to every elevator. They were introduced at the next town hall meeting. These were created by the senior leadership team behind closed doors over the course of many months, and I imagine they used some consultants too. These guiding principles sounded good, but there was no buy-in from the employees. They were not utilized. I worked closely with another company and facilitated a process by which members of the organization were asked why they worked there and what they saw as their mission. Their five guiding principles were generated from this. They were circulated throughout the company and became the North Star of absolutely everything the company did. So we have two things going on here. Do you as company leaders have clear vision and mission that everyone understands and follows? And do you make a point of helping new leaders understand what they do and why? Be able to articulate the purpose of your company and have it make sense, whether you're speaking to another senior leader or the most junior hire. When employees are more aware of how they contribute to the success of the company, they'll be more engaged. 
when you are communicating to your team or the new employee, be conscious of taking the time to make sure they are aware of how they fit in and that everyone else on the team can articulate how they fit in as well. Okay, number two. Intentionally create a culture that aligns with your core values. Culture is key. Having plaques that say one thing, for example, employees are our number one asset, but behaviors that show something different leads to morale issues and a workforce that feels deceived. The culture, this culture should align with your own values, the values of the company, and the values of each and every employee. Being able to manage through the highs and lows inevitable in any organization while setting an example for others is key to leadership. And that's where culture can be your greatest asset. Make sure your cultural behaviors cascade throughout the organization and the new hire sees it, feels it, and is expected to own and exhibit it. Whether creating an atmosphere where ideas, ideas are easily shared or where there is support to constantly improve, culture is a rallying point for success. A culture will happen. Make it an intentional culture about which everyone is clear. Number three, manage change effectively with your current team. Anytime a new employee comes on board, there is change. People respond differently to change. Being able to articulate clearly to others why this, is person, why this person is on board helps all parties manage the change. Listening and answering questions without being defensive or feeling threatened creates an important dynamic that helps enhance trust and allows all members of the team to move ahead. I started working with the president of the company after he had brought in a new operations guy to focus on implementing a lean methodology for their software tools development practice. Unfortunately, this guy was not being set up for success. The other members of the leadership team weren't given the opportunity to fully understand this new position and the impact it would have on their areas of responsibility. There's lots of resistance, and although, although the new role looked good on paper, the change management process was not helping to make him successful. The fallout was significant. There was dissension in the leadership team. People were feeling threatened, unclear. The development process he, he was charged with creating was put in place, but was not effective, as, not as effective as it could have been, and fell apart and had to be revamped when he left within two years. It was very costly. Being dialed into your own emotional intelligence to understand and manage how others might feel or be impacted by this new hire, as well as role clarity, will help make the change more successful for the team and the new individual. Number four, actively work to integrate diverse personality types on your team. Teams will always have a range of personality types and the diversity of skills and experience help to make the team innovative and always striving for excellence. For a leader, however, managing a team of strong and different personalities can be a leadership challenge. And it's even more critical when integrating a new person into the group. A team will likely have one or more rock stars, those who are consistently hitting their goals and seem to always be doing a great job. Reinforcing their success is important it's also important to avoid playing favorites and to initiate hard conversations when perhaps that rock star is not fully aligned with the team or the company culture. As you bring in new rock stars or introduce current ones to your employee, focus on how these team members can continue to be personally successful while at the same time contributing to the growth of the team and serving as a role model to other team members. Mavericks are those team members who are full of great ideas and push the boundaries and aren't afraid to move into non-traditional areas or behave somewhat differently from the rest. Leaders who are able to celebrate that spirit while also helping the Maverick understand and stick with certain norms helps to create an atmosphere of mutual success through innovation while being aligned to the values and mission. You may be bringing a Maverick aboard 
and you should embrace the excitement and be hyper-conscious of how best to utilize their talents to achieve individual and team goals while contributing positively to the team culture. A research company I worked with had a guy heading up their software implementation practice. He was smart, capable, and afraid of nothing. And he got stuff done. And he was super hard to work with. He would get angry at others, and they would get angry with him. There was lots of unnecessary drama and wasted energy dealing with all of that conflict. No one wanted to lose him, though. So we implemented a good amount of individual and group coaching to help all parties involved to show up and work together more constructively. That maverick was able to foster stronger cross-functional relationships. Others trusted him more, and productivity skyrocketed. When new members came onto the team, there was an intentional effort to understand how to work with this guy and how the new people would be involved with him. Number five, create a trust-based relationship with your new hire. Perhaps most importantly for the leader who is bringing someone onto their new team is a willingness and ability to create a trusting relationship with the new hire. More than just having regular one-on-one -on -one meetings or reviews, the leader will want to create an atmosphere from day one or from the first interview where the new employee and manager are all able to discuss the relevant aspects of their working relationship. This includes discussion of roles and responsibilities, goals, what success in this role looks like, how frequently and by what means you will communicate, how you have the difficult conversations, how you celebrate wins and address things that didn't work out so well, and how you make sure your work is aligned to make sure you as individuals and as a team are successful. Number six, navigate the highs and lows on the onboarding process. Both your head and heart are going to be involved in the onboarding of the new employee. Buyer's remorse might set in. That person you hired may not be working out as you thought they would. Maybe there are areas you thought that they could handle, and now you're seeing otherwise. There may be pushback from other parties, and you question your decision making. It's totally normal to wonder whether it was a good choice or not. If your due diligence in the hiring process was thorough, you're probably all right. Review the items above and make sure you're creating a culture of trust and transparency to evaluate the fit. If you're feeling something isn't right, your new hire probably is as well. Talk openly to be sure you can air out real or imagined problems. Understand the cycle of highs and lows for both the employee and the organization when onboarding. Sometimes it feels like a match made in heaven, Sometimes it feels like it's all wrong. At times it can be clear early on that the fit just isn't there. Make sure the decision to end the relationship is being made from a position of respect and clarity and not out of an emotional reaction to a decision you think you, might, you shouldn't have made. So to recap, the six critical steps to onboarding are being able to articulate your vision and mission intentionally create a value-driven culture, manage change, integrate personalities effectively and intentionally, create a trusting relationship, and navigate the inevitable highs and lows of the onboarding process. Stakes are high when onboarding top talent into your organization. With low unemployment, it's harder to attract talent, and it's essential to keep them and have them be as productive as possible once they come on board. Enhancing your own leadership skills and those of managers when focusing on the critical job of onboarding will help to ensure a greater likelihood of them having success in their new role. It's an opportunity for the current leaders to look at themselves and be conscious of how aligned they are with their organization's values and how effective they are at bringing new people onto the team. For leaders on today's call, 
I put out a book last summer called The Impact of Confidence, Seven Secrets of Success for the Human Side of Leadership, which delves more into the areas to improve leadership skills, including building relationships, career advancement, and career transitions. You can check it out. There's an excerpt online, and you can also purchase on Amazon. So thank you, and uh, back to you, Mary. Thank you, Tim. Uh, if you're looking for more, Tim is offering a special executive, coaching, executive leadership coaching package to the Birchworks Network tailored for hiring managers and senior leaders. The package includes assessment, workshops, and one-on-one uh, -on -one leadership coaching. If you're interested, please email info at birchworks.com for more information. To connect with Tim, you can reach out to him at the phone number shown on the screen or by emailing info at restmeyerpartners.com. You can also connect with him on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. If you're looking to add to your quantitative or marketing research staff, we'd be happy to speak with you and do some brainstorming here at Birchworks. We offer contingency and retained services from entry-level analysts, data scientists, and researchers, all the way up to chief analytics officers or VP of research searches. Feel free to send us an email if you want to chat, info at birchworks.com. And if you want to look for new opportunities or post your opportunity on our niche job board, uh, you can do that on our website, which is targeted toward quantitative roles. We offer special options depending on how many roles you'd like to post. And for more hiring market insights, check out our blog at birchworks.com slash blog, where you can find information on what motivates quantitative professionals to change jobs, how many teams are hiring this year, and how to attract top talent, as well as Tim's blog that goes along with this topic of onboarding. You can also follow Birchworks across our social media channels to stay up to date on our latest research. On our YouTube channel, found at youtube.com slash birchworks, you can find Tim's other presentations with topics including the impact of confidence on career success, setting career goals, and making successful career transitions. And now it looks like we do have some time for a few questions. Um, so if you do have a question, uh, feel free to continue sending those through to the chat function. Um, but we'll get started here. Uh, Tim. One question we've gotten, how long should an on prog onboarding program last? Yeah, that, that's um, it's very situational. It depends on the, um, you know, the nature of the role and how big the organization is and so forth. Um, I'm a strong believer that should be customized for the individual and for the organization. And it shouldn't be arbitrary and just, you know, hey, you know, two weeks onboarding and then it's all over. I actually see onboarding as a, you know, continuous kind of process because there are those highs and lows. And, you know, we all know when we've got that new job that all of a sudden it feels like, hey, I'm in it, I'm crushing it, and then all of a sudden there's that low. And it's like, why did they hire me? And, you know, what do I do now? And so there's feeling of that insecurity. And the same thing's happening from the other side, from, you know, the company. is like, man, we got this, this woman in. She's doing a great job. Everything's wonderful. But, whoa, what's she doing that for? And how's that happening? So I think the intentional onboarding of everything we talked about is the, the values, the culture, the trust is a continuous process. Yes, you've got the structural things up front, but I would suggest looking at the onboarding process as being, you know, two, three, even into six months of just being able to create those things in place to help that person gain success and not just looking at a few weeks. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, how should the onboarding process differ in a small company um, versus, um, you know, a larger, more established company? Yeah. Um, again, it's very, as I said, you know, for the prior question, it, it's all, it's, there again, it's, it's very situational. Um, if you are a small company, a startup, there might just be a handful of people who are working there. Um, and that's where, you know, I was touching on that, those leadership skills of all those individuals. How do we integrate this person into the new organization? Um, so there it could be a lot more in, informal types of things or just, um, you know, you, you just see these people all the time. But there has to be an intentionality. It's not just, hey, we hired this guy, guy start, start working. But 
addressing all the things, those six steps, all those things with them. So in a small startup or a small organization, it can be a little bit more, um, you know, fluid and organic as the person starts to grow. At a larger company, though, there are definitely going to be more structures in place. And, you know, it's a bigger organization. They have to get to know people in finance or legal or marketing or sales, you know, across the range. So there, you know, you do have to be very clear on setting up those um, prioritized conversations and those interactions across the, uh, the other groups to make sure key things don't get um, lost. I would also say to spread it out, you know, again, back to the earlier question, some of that stuff can be spread out over time. Maybe you don't have to meet everyone in every single one of those departments within the first two weeks. Maybe waiting three or four weeks will be okay because it's not an integral relationship that needs to be fostered. I've been in situations where it's, you know, the proverbial drinking out of the fire hose as you jump into a new place and then, you know, you forget things. <laughs> and so how can you spread that out over time in order to make it most effective? And um, that's where in a larger company that might be a way to go. All right, sounds great. Um, I think we're going to just have one more question here. Uh, so let's do uh, how long, uh, if you feel like somebody is maybe not a good fit and you're starting to think that way, how long should you wait before you fire them? Yeah, um, again, it, it's, it's really, you know, it's very situational. And, you know, there it takes a lot of um, thoughtful consideration of why it isn't working. And I mentioned this in the presentation. If you've done your due diligence, um, it's, it's you know probably all right. And are there things that um, you know, we, we need to work on, or that um, you know, we just we, we just really need to address? Um, and you know, so again, don't make an emotional response or somebody's barking that you know this was a terrible hire. We need to get rid of them now. Be, be patient and try to figure that out. That being said, sometimes it is clear you know that this just wasn't. A good fit and there was some sort of you know mismatch in the process or miscommunication as we were doing this and therefore um, you know let's let's cut it sooner rather than later um, again one of my you know big beliefs is the way that a company treats people on the way out says a lot about that company um, okay we made a mistake here we can treat this you know separation now with, with respect for that person for the organization for the process Something just didn't work. Um, so at times it does have to, if it's clear the cut needs to be made, do it sooner rather than later because it reflects on management if somebody is kept on who isn't productive or effective, and um, it can hurt morale and those sorts of things. So if it's clear, um, do it sooner than, rather than later and do it with respect. All right. Well, sorry to kind of end on a bummer there. Um, but thank you, everyone, <laughs> for joining us, and thank you so much for submitting questions, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.